you. So Bux has become, uh, I guess it's become a real institution. People tell me this all the time, that they've heard of Bux or they've been there wherever I go in the world. And uh, I'm always surprised, but apparently the, that we have some sort of reach. And um, it's because of the people that walk through the door. So my office is right in the middle of the restaurant. And I, I go out and I meet the most amazing people from little kids, old folks, the, the presidents of countries. I, I once had breakfast with the head of the Russian army and Bill Perry, the Secretary of Defense. And uh, he's eating pancakes and going out and smoking cigarettes and pancakes and cigarettes. We're in blue jeans, and I asked, I said, so what, and he had perfect English. I said, so what does the head of the Russian army do on a day-to-day -day basis? He said, I'm the one that put the pins in the map. I'm thinking, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> right. I love that. Uh, and so, mm, in fact, a few years ago, President Sarkozy was in from France and his wife, Carla Bruni, the model, and they're all talking to her, taking pictures of her, and he and I are standing in the hall. I said, so they're sort of, you're the president of France. They're just ignoring you. He goes, it happens all the time. Uh, so it, it's, 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 it's been such a magical experience. And um, uh, but sometimes I get a little bit of cabin fever and I need to get out, so I, I, I'm so fortunate I get to travel the world and write about my exploits and print them all on the menu, which is done on the outside like a magazine. And uh, I've, I've written a couple of books. Uh, I'm particularly enamored of San Francisco history. In fact, in, in my current book, California from 500 Feet, a story of the coastline, which is truly about my my journeys up and down the coast in a friend's Zeppelin. The only thing better than owning a Zeppelin is having a good friend that owns a Zeppelin. Authentically, a 246 foot long airship. Uh, so I, I tell stories in, in that book of fascinating characters I've met both in my own life along the coast and throughout history. And great events that happened, such as the elephant stampede that happened a block from here. You know about the elephant stampede, right? There was an elephant stampede in the city of San Francisco back in the 1920s. Uh, I mean, uh, one rogue elephant, one rogue elephant, two is a pair. Three elephants running through the streets, trashing the place. That's a stampede. The circus had come to town. Actually, you know, come to think, it wasn't really the circus. They were doing a performance on Market Street at, at one of the theaters, and they were using elephants and, and some of the circus people. So um, they paraded the elephants and other acts through the streets. Something went wrong, and they took off down Powell Street, and at one point, grabbed a cable car and pulled it and, and knocked it over. And then they went into a liquor shop and trashed that. They crashed through the windows. And they rounded them up, and they went on that night. But uh, it's funny. Everyone doesn't know that story. It's the best thing that ever happened here. Well, now I've met, I've met some, some, yeah, so far. Uh, so let's see. Let's see if we can run this thing. So some of the great characters I've met have left such an indelible mark on me. I wanted to tell you about one of them. Let's see if we can make this thing roll here. Ah, James Lick. Who was this guy, James Lick? I'll, I bet everyone here has heard the name. Well, the, you know, his name's on a freeway. He, uh, was he an educator? Maybe the mayor or an astronomer? Well, actually, the real story is pretty amazing. James Lick was born in the colorfully named town of Stumpsville, Pennsylvania in 1795. He uh, learned furniture making at his father's knee, and apparently he was quite good at it. In fact, he was good enough that he opened his own shop as a teenager, and he was good enough that he thought he could date the miller's beautiful daughter. Well, in the way of things, he got her pregnant. And so he went to the miller and said, yeah, I'd like to marry your beautiful daughter who I got pregnant. And the miller said, James Lick, you're no damn good. You're never going to amount to anything. You're a disgrace to Stumpsville. And he beat him and threatened him with worse. And young Jim thought it was time to leave town. So he moved on to New York City, where he apprenticed himself to a piano maker. Now, this is in the 18-teens, and pianos were the high-tech marvel of the age. It was, it was one of the most complicated things you could actually buy. So uh, he, he did some time in New York, and he noticed a lot of these pianos were being sent to the south in America. 
so he decided to make his fortune there and accompany a shipment of pianos. But he'd never done too much time in school, and his geography wasn't too good, so he actually ended up in South America. <laughs> well, this is now the 1820s, and making the most of it, he decided to start making pianos. Imagine how hard it would be to start from scratch making pianos. Amazingly, he was a huge success. He was so successful that uh, after a few years, he decided to go on a whirlwind trip to Europe to treat himself, but he didn't get very far before he was captured by Uruguayan pi pirates, and, and he ended up in a dungeon in Uruguay. Now, and then he escaped and went back to Buenos Aires and remarkably picked up where he left off. Well, now he's been gone for about 15 years from the United States, so he decided to send for the girl. And he wrote her and she wrote back and said, guess what, I married somebody else, I've got more kids. He said, well, how about that damn Miller? I've been a huge success. She goes, well, he's not impressed, he died. Well, then there, there, there was a political unrest there and he had to leave town all of a sudden, so he moved on to to Chile, set himself up again making pianos in Santiago. Again, a huge success. Now it's the 1830s. He's exporting pianos all over the world, Europe, China, uh, back to the United States. He's exporting pianos. And then they had a revolution, so he moved on to Peru in Lima, where he set himself up making pianos once again. He's an even bigger success. He's, he's now been in South America nearly 30 years. But it's 1846, and the United States went to war with Mexico. And it turns out most of his workers were from Mexico, and he lost them to conscription. In fact, all his workers ran off. So in 1846, he spent two years filling out the orders personally for the pianos. And then he sold a shop, and he moved to the sleepy little town of San Francisco in 1848. Now, San Francisco had a population of 1,200 people at the time. 800 of them were Mormons. Sam Brandon was a Mormon. This was the new Mormon colony. Well, he thought, he thought there were things afoot here, so he started buying property. He bought property by the bay. He bought hilltops. He bought the worthless sand dunes at the edge of town. Well, in 90 days, he owned 50 properties. He was the richest man in San Francisco. And then he knew San Francisco was going to become a state. He was just sure of it. And of course, that did come to pass. He came with $30,000 in cash in a strong box. He also came with 600 pounds of chocolate that his friend Dom, this Italian guy in Peru, said, if that sells, I'll come up and go into the chocolate business. Well, it did sell. And you've got some on your table here. Well, things are moving along. Things are, things are, are, he's doing very well. In a few weeks, everything changes. Everything changed. They discovered gold. You know, it's hard to imagine today what a giant deal that was. But the discovery of gold caused the biggest relocation of people in the world since the Crusades. People came from all over. They got gold fever. People just went nuts. I can't think of another instance where with the effort of just your hands, a pick and a shovel, and a pan, you can actually dig money out of the ground. We used gold as a medium of exchange. They said a little kid could make a, a really good living out in front of a bar where they sweep the bar out and then they'd take a wet stick and pick up the little bits of gold here in San Francisco. A kid could make five bucks a day. They came from all over. They came overland. This was the slow, steady way. You could bring a lot of the stuff with you, though. They came across the isthmus. This was the most expensive, the quickest, and the most dangerous way to go because there was so much disease in the isthmus and very unreliable transportation at the other end. But a lot of adventures came this way. Of course, most people came around the Horn. It was a rough trip, but it was relatively inexpensive and relatively safe. Well, James Lick was a pretty wealthy guy. He came by steamer. Well, San Francisco filled up with so many ships that as many as 1,200 were abandoned in San Francisco Bay in just a two-year period, even naval ships. I mean, uh, the, the hyperbole was so terrific about the gold rush that they said even the lies were true. <laughs> well, they pulled a lot of these ships up and turned them into buildings. But of course, they didn't last long, and it, it wasn't really practical. What to do with all these ships? I mean, there were a lot of them. Well, then James Lick and his friends hit on a brilliant idea. 
Let's fill them with dirt. Let's turn them into real estate. These were the famous water lots. It turns out that on land, it was very difficult to transfer property before California became a state because there was really no state government to do it. But the water lots didn't fall under that jurisdiction. So this became the financial district. This is the, was the most expensive real estate in San Francisco then and now, but this was all underwater. It was all filled. And if you think building on that's a problem, well, it is. The Millennium Tower's definitely in that area. <laughs> well, James Lick himself was, a, was not a well-liked man. He was known to ride around in a beat-up old wagon, dressing in rags, mismatched mules, and go from butcher shop to butcher shop collecting bones grinding them up to put on his fruit trees in Santa Clara Valley. He, uh, he built the Lick House, the most fabulous hotel west of the Mississippi. He was known to sleep in a room on a door with four nail kegs and a thin mattress because he was really a spare guy. He wasn't much fun. He never did go into the ballroom and have dinner. That sat 800 people. This, uh, this hotel burned in the San Francisco earthquake. In fact, San Francisco burned with some frequency. Really great for urban renewal, seriously. But in the 1860s, he decided to buy some less flammable property, so he moved on out into the country and bought uh, some really premier pieces, such as Lake Tahoe. He owned Lake Tahoe. He owned whole square miles of Santa Clara Valley where he planted orchards and, and farms and he built the world's largest grist mill. Hmm, do we remember a miller? That, that silo on the right is still there along with the Lick Mansion. It looked more like a bank inside really than, than the offices of a mill. It was all fine woodwork and marble and brass. He did a lot of the woodwork personally too. He moved on to LA and bought Hollywood. Yeah, this is Hollywood before the movie industry. And one of his prized possessions, he owned the entire island of Catalina. Well, now it's time to think about legacy. He wasn't a young man when he showed up in San Francisco. He was in his 50s, but now he's in his 70s. And he decided to give a gift to the city. At the top of Russian Hill, he proposed to the city fathers that he build three statues as his memorial to himself and his parents. Uh, and, and they'd overlook the bay 90 feet tall, and they were absolutely aghast. He said, that's a terrible idea. They'll, they'll make a target for the invading Russians. You don't want to do that. He said, yeah, you're right. How about this? How about if on my land at Montgomery and Market, I own a city block, I build the world's largest pyramid, bigger than the Great Pyramid of Egypt, 400 feet tall. He owned a quarry. He definitely could do it. He was the richest man in the West. And they said, ah, ah, that's awful. Don't do that. That's terrible. He thought, huh. So then he did an amazing about face. He decided to endow all sorts of civic projects. He was never known as the wildly civic-minded guy, but he, 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 he built the Conservatory of Flowers. He built an orphanage. He endowed all sorts of statuary of famous people, still there today. He built an old folks' home. He he founded Lick High School, which became Lick Wilmerdick. He, he did another high school in San Jose. Some 20 projects in all. Whoops. But still, he had no tomb. So along the way, he met the world's most prominent astronomer, a fellow from Berkeley, who said, how about building the world's greatest observatory? And in it, put the greatest, most modern telescope in the world. And this could be your tomb. And indeed, James Lick is buried under that telescope. That is his tomb. One third of his estate went to build that uh, Mount Hamilton Lick Observatory. Well, San Francisco eventually got its pyramid, if one somewhat reduced. <laughs> And what about Stumpsville, Pennsylvania, where so long ago he was told he'd amount to no good? Well, they renamed that town Lickdale. <laughs> Thank you.